this session, we're completing the discussion of high-yield gastrointestinal topics frequently tested on the USMLE Step 1 exam. Let's start with celiac disease, which is a highly high-yield topic. First case. We have is a six-year-old girl who presents with a two-month history of intermittent abdominal cramps, bloating, and diarrhea. She also reports excessive flatulence, especially after meals. Her vital signs are appropriate for her age, and physical examination reveals a mildly distended abdomen without tenderness or organomegaly. Laboratory evaluation shows elevated tissue transglutaminase antibodies. This case is typical of celiac disease, a gluten-sensitive enteropathy. The immune-mediated destruction of the small intestinal mucosa leads to malabsorption, with symptoms such as abdominal pain, diarrhea, and bloating. The diagnosis is confirmed by duodenal biopsy, which reveals characteristic findings such as intraepithelial lymphocytosis, villus atrophy, and crypt hyperplasia. This case emphasizes the importance of recognizing these clinical and histological features, which are frequently tested on the USMLE. Next, consider a 14-month-old girl who has experienced diarrhea for two months. Her parents report three to five loose, non-bloody bowel movements daily, with occasional vomiting. The child has lost weight over this period, despite a previously well-balanced diet. Physical examination reveals no significant findings, but laboratory evaluation and duodenal biopsy confirm the diagnosis of celiac disease. In this case, the early introduction of gluten into the diet has triggered an immune response, leading to symptoms of malabsorption. As seen in the previous case, the duodenal biopsy is crucial for diagnosis, showing villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, and intraepithelial lymphocyte infiltration. This case is a reminder of the varied presentations of celiac disease, which the USMLE Step 1 exam often highlights. We now move to a 25-year-old woman with progressive fatigue and intermittent loose stools. She has also experienced abdominal cramps and mild weight loss. Physical examination reveals conjunctival pallor and a mildly distended abdomen. Laboratory findings include anemia and low ferritin levels, while duodenal biopsy shows intraepithelial lymphocytosis. This patient's presentation of celiac disease is more subtle lacking the overt gastrointestinal symptoms seen in children. Instead, the primary manifestations are due to malabsorption of nutrients, leading to iron deficiency anemia. The NBME frequently tests on the various presentations of celiac disease, especially the atypical ones, which makes this case particularly high yield. In our final case, a 36-year-old man presents with a pruritic rash over the elbows and knees, accompanied by a long history of episodic abdominal discomfort, flatulence, and greasy stools. Skin examination reveals a papulovesicular rash consistent with dermatitis herpetiformis. A duodenal biopsy shows classic celiac disease findings, including increased intraepithelial lymphocytes and villus atrophy. Dermatitis herpetiformis is a hallmark of celiac disease and is strongly associated with it. The presence of this skin manifestation alongside gastrointestinal symptoms should prompt immediate investigation for celiac disease. The USMLE often includes questions on the dermatologic manifestations of systemic diseases, making this case a key area of focus. In summary, celiac disease is a multi-system disorder with a wide range of presentations. From gastrointestinal symptoms to extraintestinal manifestations like dermatitis herpetiformis, the condition is an important topic on step one exam. The key to mastering questions on celiac disease lies in understanding its pathophysiology, recognizing the varied clinical presentations, and knowing the appropriate diagnostic tests. Be sure to review these aspects thoroughly as they are frequently tested by the NBME. Another crucial gastrointestinal pathology case is acute pancreatitis and its complications. Let's explore a case involving a 35-year-old man admitted to the hospital with a two-day history of abdominal pain. Unfortunately, his condition deteriorated over the course of his hospitalization, and he passed away five days after admission. Autopsy revealed chalky white lesions in the mesentery. Histologic evaluation of these lesions showed adipose cell destruction and calcium deposition, hallmarks of fat necrosis. 
This clinical scenario is most consistent with acute pancreatitis. Normally, pancreatic digestive enzymes are secreted in an inactive form to prevent autodigestion, becoming active only when they reach the duodenum. However, in acute pancreatitis, these enzymes become prematurely activated within the pancreas itself, leading to acinar cell damage and inflammation. The release of lipase and other digestive enzymes from the inflamed pancreas damages nearby adipose tissue. Liberated fatty acids then bind with calcium ions, precipitating as insoluble calcium salts in a process known as saponification, which gives the lesions their characteristic chalky white appearance. Microscopically, this is seen as necrotic adipocytes, cells that have lost their nuclei, accompanied by blue calcium deposits. In mild cases of acute pancreatitis, fat necrosis may be confined to the pancreas and the surrounding areas. However, as the inflammation progresses, acute necrotic pancreatitis can develop. This severe form of pancreatitis is characterized by extensive fat necrosis that spreads to the mesentery, omentum, and other parts of the abdominal cavity, driven by widespread lipase activity. Additionally, elastase-mediated destruction of blood vessel walls can lead to hemorrhage within the necrotic areas, resulting in what is known as hemorrhagic pancreatitis. This may present grossly as black hemorrhagic areas, further complicating the clinical picture. Understanding the pathophysiology of acute pancreatitis is crucial not only for managing patients effectively, but also for tackling related questions on the step one. Key points to remember include the role of lipase in fat necrosis, the process of saponification, and the progression from mild pancreatitis to necrotizing and hemorrhagic forms. This high yield topic is frequently tested on step one, and a solid grasp of its presentation, complications, and underlying mechanisms will serve you well on exam day. Let's consider the case of a 48-year-old male who is admitted to the hospital with severe epigastric abdominal pain and vomiting following an episode of binge drinking. Four weeks after the initial event, he presents with a palpable upper abdominal mass. A CT scan reveals a cystic lesion in the upper abdomen, marked by an asterisk in the provided image. This lesion is most likely a pancreatic pseudocyst, a common complication of acute pancreatitis. In acute pancreatitis, the proteolytic enzymes can disrupt the walls of the pancreatic ducts, causing the leakage of pancreatic secretions into the surrounding peripancreatic space. This fluid, rich in pancreatic enzymes, triggers an inflammatory response in the tissues of the surrounding organs. Over time, granulation tissue forms around this fluid collection, encapsulating it and leading to the formation of a pseudocyst. It's important to understand that a pseudocyst differs from a true cyst. While a true cyst is lined with epithelial cells, the walls of a pseudocyst are composed of granulation tissue and fibrosis without any epithelial lining. This process of maturation, where the walls become firm and fibrotic, typically occurs four to six weeks after the onset of acute pancreatitis. The most common location for a pancreatic pseudocyst is in the lesser peritoneal sac, bordered by the stomach, duodenum, and transverse colon. In this case, the CT scan indicates that the pseudocyst is located in the lesser sac, just posterior to the stomach. Understanding the formation and characteristics of pancreatic pseudocysts is crucial for the step one, as questions often explore the differentiation between pseudocysts and other cystic lesions of the pancreas, such as serous or mucinous neoplasms. So in summary, pancreatic pseudocysts are a common complication of acute pancreatitis, characterized by a collection of enzyme-rich fluid and inflammatory debris. Their walls consist of granulation tissue and fibrosis, distinguishing them from true cysts, which are lined by epithelium. Let's move to next frequently tested topic, and we have a 49-year-old man who presents with a persistent dry cough that occurs mainly at night, alongside frequent sore throat and occasional epigastric discomfort. Despite trying various over-the-counter remedies, his symptoms persist, the patient's history includes obesity and diet-controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus, but he denies smoking or alcohol use. 
Physical examination and chest x-ray are unremarkable, and pulmonary function testing is normal. However, upper gastrointestinal endoscopy with biopsy reveals intestinal type columnar epithelium with goblet cells in the lower esophagus, a hallmark of Barrett esophagus. Barrett esophagus is a metaplastic condition where normal stratified squamous epithelium is replaced by intestinal type columnar epithelium due to chronic exposure to acidic gastric contents. This metaplasia occurs as an adaptive response, but significantly increases the risk of developing esophageal adenocarcinoma. Patients with long-standing and severe gastroesophageal reflux disease are most at risk for this condition. For the step one, it's crucial to recognize that Barrett esophagus is strongly associated with an increased risk of adenocarcinoma, which is a key point often tested in exams. Next, consider a 53-year-old man who presents with severe heartburn and difficulty swallowing over the past few weeks. His symptoms have been progressively worsening despite lifestyle modifications and proton pump inhibitor therapy. An upper gastrointestinal endoscopy and subsequent biopsy reveal columnar epithelium with goblet cells in the lower esophagus, indicative of Barrett esophagus. This case exemplifies metaplasia, a process where one differentiated cell type is replaced by another due to chronic irritation. In this case, the replacement of normal esophageal squamous epithelium with columnar epithelium better suited to withstand acidic environments. This process is similar to the metaplasia seen in the respiratory tract of chronic smokers where ciliated columnar cells are replaced by squamous epithelium. Recognizing metaplasia is essential as it is a reversible condition but can lead to dysplasia and eventually malignancy if the irritating factor persists. Now let's discuss a 53-year-old man with a chronic nocturnal cough. He undergoes upper endoscopy with biopsy, which shows elongation of the lamina propria papillae with eosinophils and neutrophils scattered within the squamous epithelium. His symptoms resolve with the initiation of proton pump inhibitor therapy, indicating that gastroesophageal reflux disease was the underlying cause. GERD results from the incompetence of the gastroesophageal junction often due to excessive relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter or anatomical disruptions such as a hiatal hernia. This incompetence allows acidic gastric contents to reflux into the esophagus, leading to inflammation, irritation, and histological changes in the esophageal mucosa. Key histologic findings in GERD include basal zone hyperplasia, elongation of the lamina propria papillae, and scattered eosinophils and neutrophils. Understanding the pathophysiology of GERD and its complications, such as erosive esophagitis, strictures, and Barrett esophagus, is crucial for the Step 1 exam. Thank you for joining this episode of the Metacoccus video series. Stay tuned for more high-yield discussions on topics that frequently appear in your NBME and USMLE exams.